the Sierra Pandols in Catalonia, southwest of Barcelona. In these mountains and beneath in the valley of the river Ebro, young British men fought and died in the last great battles of the Spanish Civil War. In summer 1936, a military uprising against the elected government of the Spanish Republic met with resistance in many of Spain's towns and cities. Civil war followed. The right-wing rebels, or nationalists, were openly backed by the two fascist powers, Germany and Italy. Overseas support for the Republic came principally from the Soviet Union. To defend Spanish democracy, individual foreign volunteers arrived, as many as 40,000 from 50 countries, the majority to serve in the international brigades. From Britain, over 2,000 men and women journeyed to Spain. More than 500 were killed. In victory, the nationalists destroyed commemorative evidence of the foreign volunteers. Battlefield monuments like these were demolished, graves desecrated. In spring 2000, a group of Spaniards went in search of a memorial to English-speaking volunteers rumored to be lying intact and undisturbed on a remote mountainside in the Sierra Pandols. The memorial they found, and subsequently restored, bears the names of officers from the 15th International Brigade, among them Americans, Canadians, and five Britons. Harry Dobson, Lewis Clive, Wally Tapsell, David Guest, and Maurice Miller. A year after the memorial's rediscovery, three of the original party returned to the site. For these Spaniards, born long after the Civil War and into an environment in which the conflict was rarely discussed, the memorial had a distinct sense of mystery. Aquello pues fue muy impactante porque la, la misma forma piramidal de tres escalones era muy curiosa, ¿no? Además con todo lleno de nombres y no sabíamos ni los nombres ni de quiénes eran ni nada, ¿no? Y el Luis Clay o Clive quedó bien. Sí. Sí. ¿Y esto lo restauras? ¿Está caído o qué? No, eso no se llevó. Había tan poco espacio para poner cemento que no ni aguantaba. Harry, Harry, no, Harry, Harry Dobson. Harry Dobson was a coal miner from the Rhondda Valley in South Wales. Lewis Clive was a direct descendant of Clive of India and godson of conservative politician Neville Chamberlain. Educated at Eton and Oxford, he won a gold medal rowing for Britain in the 1932 Olympics. Wally Tapsell was a working-class Londoner who had been prominent in the Young Communist League. David Guest also came from London. The son of a Labour MP, he was a Cambridge-educated mathematician and writer. Maurice Miller was a grammar school boy from Hull in Yorkshire. At the time of the uprising in Spain, he was training to be a pharmacist. Each died in battle, in a war against fascism, many years ago. Yet the rediscovery of the memorial in the Sierra Pandols has contemporary resonance in Britain. For there are men still living who knew and fought alongside the five whose names are crudely inscribed on these three blocks of concrete. I knew Harry Dobson. He was a Ronda boy like myself. Lewis Clive was a great, big, strong, hefty fellow, and I called him Comrade Clive. I heard about Wally Tapsell in, in the Daily Worker. He'd worked in the Daily Worker. 
I knew of David Guess. He was attached to uh, battalion headquarters. I've seen him quite often, and uh, he looked very frail. Morris Miller was the deputy commissar to the, the, the battalion commissar, very committed to the cause, a very friendly person. These men, from different parts of the country, from diverse social and political backgrounds, all came to maturity in the 1930s. It was a decade in which fascism seemed to be in the ascendant. And Britain, like most countries in Europe, had its own domestic variety. Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists, the Black Shirts. There was always discussions going on about, about uh, politics and so on, which I, I took no interest in at all. John Dunlop came from a middle-class background in Edinburgh. Educated at private school, he studied to be a chartered accountant. I noticed that nobody had a good word for the for the Conservatives. Nobody had a good word for the Labour people. So I started, well, who else are they? Well, at that time, Mosley and his fascists were making a big noise. So I wrote away to them, and I got, I got back some absolute rubbish of a political propaganda, mostly violently anti-Jewish stuff. So I thought, well, I've been this lot. Mosley's provocative behaviour, the use of violence as a political tactic, the uniforms and parades culminated in 1936 with the attempt by the Black Shirts to march through a predominantly Jewish area of London's East End. The organisation against the fascists in Cable Street was completely organised by the Communist Party, Phil Perattin. He was the, the organiser. Sol Frankel was born and brought up in the East End of London. Leaving school at 14, he worked as a tailor. At that time, I was in the Labour Party League of Youth. So we went on uh, Sunday to Cable Street, and, oh, God almighty. Alan Williams was a miner from South Wales. Buried alive in a roof fall, he left the coalfield and joined the army as a first aid man. Leaving the army, he moved to London. And there was a, a hell of a big crowd there. The riots were started, the cavalry was called, and I was pushed forward by the crowd behind me, and I was knocked down by a horse. And suddenly, for some reason or the other, the police started charging and demonstrating. It was a real mass offensive against the poor demonstrator. They have those long stick staves, I suppose they are, drawn. And uh, we, we easily stopped them. We just threw marbles in the, in the roadway there. And if a marble gets in a horse's hoof, he's, he's kaput more or less. There was a good combination of Jewish workers, Irish workers, and people generally opposing the the black shirts in their conduct and, their, and in their attitude and in the policies, of course. Jack Jones came from Liverpool. He worked on the docks and was active from an early age in the labour movement. Uh, as I saw it, it was, it was a danger to trade unionism, it was a danger to freedom. The Battle of Cable Street, as it became known, took place in the months after the military rebellion in Spain. If opposition to fascism at home found expression in demonstrations and street fights, Spain presented an opportunity for a more decisive response. It was obvious to me uh, that uh, what was happening in Spain was a threat to the rest of Europe. I felt, here's something I can really do with my life. I can go and, I can go and join the fight in Spain against fascism. The main reason was that when I, when I heard an iron bevan. George Wheeler was the son of a Labour Party activist in South London. A boxer and athlete, he worked as a wood machinist. He gave a speech, he gave such an impassioned speech about the things that were going on in Spain. Immediately I, I heard him. My mind was made up on the, on the moment, I'm going to Spain. At the time, I was very friendly with a fellow called Billy Davis. We were school friends, and he was in London. He was on the door, and he was a very active anti-fascist. Anyway, Billy went to Spain. And I, I thought, well, I don't know. Billy's gone to Spain. Why didn't I go? 
I remember when I, I decided that I would go to fight in Spain because of the my beliefs in the anti-fascist struggle. It was a, a, way, a way, you know, we'd take up arms against them. Meanwhile, the Western democratic governments adopted a position of neutrality or non-intervention towards the war in Spain. In principle, it meant denying arms and supplies to both sides. In practice, it allowed Hitler and Mussolini to underwrite the rebellion. And in line with this policy of non-intervention, the British government tried to prevent volunteers from travelling to Spain by invoking an old law that made it illegal to enlist in a foreign army. Where we went was we didn't announce where we were going. I mean, there was a, uh, a joint body in London. So I went to the Communist Party headquarters at uh, King Street and I said I would like to go to Spain. So I've um, been in the army, yes. Oh, well, gee, we're the blokes you want. So I, well, they said, come back on a Friday morning and we'll fix you up. So I went back on the Friday morning and I was there with four other fellas. And then we carried on to Paris. You went in twos and threes. Well, I had I led half a dozen, including George George Wheeler. We went to Paris, and Jack Jones had all the um, necessary um, instructions. Eventually, we assembled and we got a coach down toward the, the the foothills of the Pyrenees. It looked as though we were all tourists, but as soon as we got into the coach, we were all jabbering away in different languages. We had to cross the Pyrenees, avoiding the frontier guards. We must have started about as the sun was going down, and it took all night to cross. Rather, this grim, these grim mountains. You go up one, go down, up again. I don't know. Thought you thought one was enough, but there were several <laughs> going up, and uh, it was precarious at times. I, I stumbled many a time. And, Black behind me managed to keep me upright, but we did lose a couple of people. We could see the lights of the non-intervention patrol, which had established by that time. They had searchlights searching the, the hillside, the, the slopes of the Pyrenees. Don't forget, we were supposed to be acting surreptitiously, that it, because it was illegal. We had to avoid the French police or, or French army people who, who may have been about. Until eventually, when dawn broke, we were on the top of the Pyrenees, more or less, on the Spanish side, and we could look down over the mountains towards the Mediterranean, and there we, I saw my first glimpse, this beautiful blue sea. We saw some Catalonian uh, farm workers on the, on the way, and they were giving the clenched fist salute and encouraging us all the way, and then we became familiar with the the cry, no pass around, they shall not pass. All of a sudden, somebody started to sing the international and it was the most wonderful experience of my life up till then. To hear the international sung in all the languages of the, of the international brigade. <laughs> 